Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Meta Cafe. Grab your cup of coffee, your tea, or your water, and sit back and let's talk a little bit about what's going on energetically today on the planet. Hmm, right? It's a great day here, at least. It's beautiful, sunny. I know we're headed for rain again, but that's the typical here. So I'm just going to enjoy the day, right? So raise your hand if you went outside last night where you lived and looked at the sky, because I tell you, last night's sky was awesome. Good morning, Suzanne. I missed you yesterday, Suzanne. I did not see you out there. I thought, oh, no, I never said hello to Suzanne. And then I looked and didn't see anything uh, that you even checked in yesterday morning. So you, my friend, were missed. We're glad to see you this morning. So last night, you know, I, I live in the Pacific Northwest, and so as the days get longer, um, it's really not really very dark until after nine o'clock or so at night. And, you know, by the time we get into the longest day of the year, it is really close to 10 o'clock at night before we can, for example, on the 4th of July, you know, it's 10 or 10, 15 before we can actually even see fireworks because of the, you know, far north that we are in. And um, last night, it was about, oh, I don't know. I guess it was just before I was going to go to bed. So it was probably 1030. I decided to take a last check of the sky, right? I, I walked outside. First thing, it was it was for, sort of balmy out there for us. I mean, maybe 50, 55 degrees. And uh, so I could walk outside without having to grab a coat. And I the first thing that caught my attention is looking to the west was the brilliant planet Venus. And she was magnificent. She almost looked like the lights from an approaching airplane. She was so bright. And good morning, Casildra. It's good to see you out there. And good morning, Suzanne, or not Suzanne, Roseanne. Too many Anns at the end. Casildra, Suzanne, Roseanne. Good morning, Mimi. Great to see you all this morning. So if there was Venus in all of her glory, she was so bright. At first, I thought I was watching an airplane on approach. And then I realized airplanes don't approach from the West. And so that has to be a planet. And then I realized it was absolutely Venus. And then as I turned around, I said to my husband, who was out there looking at the stars with me, I said, now, if we turn around directly behind us should be Jupiter. And absolutely, there in the eastern sky, having risen just after the sunset, was the beautiful planet Jupiter, nearly as bright as Venus, although Venus is closer. So she's definitely the winner in the brightness category. But oh, it was so awe-inspiring, right? I talk about the planets and I talk about the stars all the time to all of you. But when I get a chance to go out and then I can visually connect to what it is that I'm telling you about, it just is, it, it defies words. It's amazing. And there, so tonight, if you have an opportunity right now, today, the sun and earth and Jupiter are in, in a, an alignment right? So Jupiter and the Earth are kind of occupying the same space, and they're opposing the Sun. Well, of course, the Earth is always opposing the Sun, but right now Jupiter happens to be in alignment with the Earth, so all three of them are in a line, which is why they look so beautiful, right? That's why the, you know, the planet Jupiter is so beautiful right now. And uh, there's something magical when we can connect that way. We see that we're a part of something bigger than what we normally think of ourselves, that we're part of a bigger cosmos. And to me, that's the magic of, of watching the skies. Um, Casildra, hugs and kisses to you and the new beautiful grandbaby. Oh my gosh, thank you. He is adorable, isn't he? Of course, all babies are adorable. I, I think I've never seen a baby that I didn't want to hug and kiss and squeeze their little cheeks and tickle their little bellies. Um, they're just adorable. And uh, I get to spend Mother's Day with Wyatt. We're all going to get together on Mother's Day, which is this Sunday, and head to the zoo. Good morning, Libby. It's good to see you out there too this morning. Roseanne says, beautiful planets. And Libby says, good morning. So we have our crew together here. So let's launch into what is going to be the energy of today. Um, first of all, we are going to experience a void of course moon today. The moon all day stays in the sign of Aquarius. So we're still having this, you know, interesting um, viewpoint kind of thing going on. I want to tell you a little more about that in just a minute. The void of course moon begins at 1029 p.m. for you people on the East Coast and ends at 1111 p.m 
Hmm. I love it when we see those repeating numbers. There's got to be something for you all on the East Coast, a portal, an awakening as the moon begins to move out of Aries or uh, Aquarius and into Pisces. For us on the West Coast, it is 7.29 p.m. and 8.11 p.m. when the void, of course, moon is over. So it doesn't, it's not really very uh, much going to affect or disrupt your day. Um, it is just a very soft changing of the energy from Aquarius into Pisces. And I, I, I think that's lovely, right? So it bodes well for dreams tonight and for uh, tapping into compassion and um, unconditional love. So enjoy that. <clears throat> so interesting stuff happened yesterday. You know, I, I always like to look at the world from the symbologies that the things that I'm seeing in my outer world that match what's going on in the skies above, or the things that are happening in the outer world that mirror what's going on in my inner world. So yesterday, remember, we were talking about the moon being in Aquarius, and it gives us an uh, access to a unique perspective um, it's tantamount, what I didn't say out loud, is that it's tantamount to being able to see the world from upside down, right? Taking a look at it from a completely different perspective. So, you know, when I get done in the morning with you guys, I take my video off of Facebook and I turn it into a YouTube and I go through a whole bunch of different production things to get the video out and to get it onto the various social medias. So yesterday I was on Instagram because that's one of the places I go to, to post the video thumbnail. And um, I saw this thing, this picture of, of, it was a beautiful crystals and it was upside down. And it said, this is from a friend of mine, actually. She says, I'm viewing my world from the opposite direction. <laughs> and as I scrolled up, the next picture I see is another gentleman who sometimes joins us here in the morning, Christian, and he's lying upside down and he's taking a picture of himself from upside down. And I, I, I just had to laugh, right? Because it was so perfectly demonstrative of what the moon in Aquarius brings to us. So today we have the whole day of turning our world upside down and viewing it from that different direction. Or maybe you want to turn it this way, right? Maybe you want to turn it the other way. But whatever you do, turn it some way, right? Get a different viewpoint, get a different perspective on what's going on in your life, on who's in your life, on what is the world showing you, etc. Post your Instagram. I will, I think. Here's the funny thing about Instagram, guys. Here's the funny thing about social media. I have grandkids that are teenagers and I love them dearly, but they they do funny things to my phone. Like they change my name on my phone. Uh, last week I was Big Daddy Granny. My, my phone, when I talk to Siri and say, what's my name? It says, oh, <laughs> your name is Big Daddy Granny. But I can call you Janet because we're friends. And I just started laughing because I don't even know how to change the name on my phone. But my grandkids will get grandma's phone and they will play games with it. And then they change my name. And I've had many other weird names too. But it's really kind of the thing that, <laughs> that kids are so good at these days is technology. So it was my granddaughter who said, oh, grandma, you need to have an Instagram and a Snapchat. And I went, okay. Uh, I just barely know what to do with Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. Now you want me to add these other two things to it. So she set up my Instagram. Well, I never knew what my Instagram name was. People would say, what's your Instagram? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. So I will have to look it up for you, Roseanne, because I know, I think I sort of know what, <laughs> what it is. I know how to get to it. I know how to post on it now. Um, Snapchat, I gave up on. I just gave up on it, right? I mean, seriously, why is there such a thing as Snapchat? And they told me the history of it. Now, how your grandkids at, you know, teenagers know the history of Snapchat is beyond me, but they do. And uh, so anyway, crazy stuff, but technology is really fascinating to me as an adult, a middle-aged adult, but my teenaged and younger even grandchildren have it whipped, right? They know everything about it. So as soon as I find out what my Instagram name is, I will certainly post that for you all, if in case you're on Instagram. Um, yes, kids, definitely. Roseanne says that's hilarious. <laughs> it is hilarious if you think about it. 
because I'll always call Mackenzie, my oldest granddaughter, because she has an iPhone success like I do. Actually, I think she has a, a newer model now. And I'll call her and go, Mackenzie, how do you do this? Mackenzie, how do you do that? And she laughs at me, but she will very nicely tell me how to take care of my phone or what to do on my phone. So here we have another full day then. Turn your world upside down and look at it from a different direction. Interestingly enough, the planet Uranus is the ruler of the sign, the, the more modern ruler of the sign Aquarius. And it is the one planet that sort of does this in its um, orbit instead of the usual, you know, going like this. So it already has a unique perspective. It has of the planets in our solar system, it does some weird things, right? It has a real quirkiness about it. So it is the planet that represents the sign Aquarius. And therefore, Aquarius is also sort of that quirky, unique, turn that frown upside down, get a new perspective kind of sign. And so we have that as an ac uh, access point for us for the whole day, as we have had for the last couple of days. The other thing that happened yesterday is that, um, again, this goes back to the symbology, the things that I'm seeing in the outer world that are hearkening us back to times past when the planet, a planet was moving through the same sign. Um, and yesterday, I was on Facebook, I think I was waiting for the download to finish and I saw this video. Um, there's a guy named Robert Reich, I think is his name. He does a lot of political videos and he'll, he does really good job at explaining things about politics and what's going down. And yesterday, what caught my attention was this big sign that said Monopoly and something about, you know, is America moving toward, are, are corporations monopolizing, da, da, da. I don't know. I didn't even listen to the video. But what I honed in on was the fact that Uranus is getting ready to move into Taurus and the last time when Uranus was in Taurus, the game Monopoly came about, was birthed. And here we see the word Monopoly now blasting into our awareness in this modern age, 84 years after the fact that that, you know, game came about. It was somewhere in that seven year period that it, it was um, brought into being. Now, it has a more sinister meaning here, in, in, of course, than what he's um, trying to talk to us about. He's trying to talk to us about a very corporate ruled political situation where corporations uh, are able to make the rules and because they have all the money and they have all the power, which turns our democracy into a corporatocracy, if you will. And so monopolies are a very um, important thing for us to take a look at. And the possibility here, I was just looking, I think it was the other day I heard that Sprint and T-Mobile want to merge. Well, they tried this a couple of years ago, I think it was, or maybe it was a year ago, and they were turned down uh, for that because of whatever reasons. I don't remember because I wasn't really cued into it. And here they are again trying to establish a merger that would then take two huge companies and put them into one company. So interesting for um, us to watch as time goes on to see what it is that that might mean for us as we go down the line in terms of Uranus moving into Taurus and bringing all of this kind of financial stuff into our awareness in a big way. Um, a friend of mine pointed out yesterday too that some of the things that we're seeing going on in Hawaii with the volcanic eruptions, the major earthquakes is also interesting when we think of the dynamics of Uranus at the cusp of moving out of Aries, a fire sign. And what we have there is lava, fire, burning the forest, burning people's homes, destroying as it goes. But we also have a duality inherent in this, right? Because it's that very lava that created those islands. And so we have earth building going on at the same time that we have some very destructive energies coming up out of fire. And I thought that was interesting with Uranus perched right there at the cusp of a fire sign and an earth sign. So does that mean that we might see more of the earth shaking volcanic stuff? Well, certainly, but that goes on all the time. So I'm not expecting that, you know, it will be anything more than usual or anything that we have to be worried about. But I do believe that we may see um, something like that. May maybe even what's happening in Hawaii is the herald of Uranus moving into 
Taurus, but there could be more. There could be something else that happens next week as Uranus actually transitions into that sign. So I thought it was like, you know, again, another life imitating art or art imitating life. I mean, the outer world uh, as above, so below, right? Our, our earthly plane of being a reflection of what's going on in the skies and vice versa. Very, very fascinating to me. So I, I brought up the, the word duality because I thought today, well, today the sun is in an opposition to Jupiter. And I said this earlier that Jupiter and the earth then were in a conjunction. So if we look at human design, what we see is the earth and Jupiter perched at gate one, and we see the sun perched at gate two. So I was working this through my mind this morning about 15 minutes before we went on air. And what I realized is, oh my gosh, um, gate one, this the first gate, is the most masculine gate. It, it In the I Ching, there are six changing lines, and all six lines are in masculine energy at gate one. So we have uh, the most masculine energy coming from the Earth and Jupiter's placement right now. The Sun, literally one of the most masculine planets, is now sitting at gate two, which is, if you look at the I Ching, all six lines are lined up in the feminine energies. So we have the very masculine sun placed in the most receptive feminine gate. So I wondered what this had to do with um, some of the energies that are going on on the planet. And I realized that those two gates right there, one and two, the beginning, those two gates kind of very much epitomize the nature of duality on this planet or why there is duality. And I went to, you know, looking in the gene keys and what Richard Red says is that the gate one or the, the masculine energy. So the masculine energy of gate one is the primary code for all creative life in the universe. And the feminine energy at gate two is the primary code for directing all creative life in the universe. Interesting, right? Because that puts the feminine energy squarely in the seat of importance where the, where the divine feminine has in some ways over the last centuries been um, covered up or uh, disempowered. The, the DNA which really the I Ching is, and it's 64 hexagrams, is literally just a mirror of our human DNA and all of its traits and all of its potential. And you have in your human design 64 gates that are a mirror of the I Ching and a mirror of your DNA. It's extraordinary in the coherence that develops between these three systems. Um, so it is really incumbent upon the feminine at this point in time to rise up and to meet the masculine, not allowing the masculine to overtake us ever again, right? Or allowing the feminine to overtake the masculine. It's not that way. It's not meant to work in that fashion. They're meant to work together. And it reminded me of the conversation, I think it was last week, where we were talking about how, how your human design arises out of conception at, at uh, the point of conception where a design crystal, i.e. your soul, comes down, or that is, you know, who knows if it's down or up or in or out, but just for ease of expression, where the, the design crystal for your soul is emerging out of spirit, and the design crystal for your physical existence here on earth rises up to meet the spirit, and it reminded me of the coming together of the two parts of the um, uh, Jewish star. What is that called? The Star of David, the six-sided star, and the joining of those two as triangles coming together to form the six-pointed star, um, symbolizing the balance of masculine and feminine energy. Remember, in the ancient religions, um, Egyptian times, for example, and even in the Greek pantheon and in the uh, Norse myths and legends, there was always a sky god. 
And the sky god was often represented as the masculine energy, the masculine energy and the earth goddess was always feminine. And it was the coming together of the sky god and the earth god that created life on this planet that indeed created life in humans. And we are the embodiment of the coming together of the masculine and the feminine energies. And I, I don't know, I just found that to be an extraordinary thing for us to understand is that we are all, even though everything on this planet is about duality, it is the coming together of those two things that creates our reality. And the reality is then we can't have one without the other. And I was thinking about this in terms of embracing our shadow selves, right? We have lots of different places in our charts where um, uh, Callius, the sky god, you're going to have to tell me who he is because I've never heard that name. I've heard of Zeus. I've heard of, uh, you know, I don't know, many of them. Odin, um, Ra. And there was another one in, uh, was it Osiris in Egyptian myth that was also a sky god? Um, many different points of view, but tell me who he is, okay? Because I like to know mythology. <clears throat> anyway, so the idea of uh, bringing together these energies causes us, is it the cause? Mm, I think it's the need for us to embrace our shadows, to embrace that shadow expression, which by the way, in gate one is entropy. And I wondered if there was a really good description of entropy in here, because the name of the, you know, the name of the key gene key one is from entropy to syntropy. Um, so entropy is a simple definition of entropy is, and this is from Gene Keys, a measure of the disorder or unavailability of energy within a closed system. More entropy means less energy available for doing work. Okay. So modern physics and the laws of thermodynamics are based upon the perceived law of entropy. According to what we can see through the mind, the universe appears to have a single direction. It moves from order towards chaos. The first shadow keeps the entire planet living at a low level frequency. It's like a blanket thrown over civilization. Yikes. According to our mind, we cannot do anything about entropy. That is our chief problem. Human beings do not generally accept themselves. And when you convert entropy into human feeling, it becomes a kind of deep numbness or sense of gloom. Entropy is in effect, is in effect, the opposite of love. Wow. And he goes on to say, if you read the, the first gene key deeply through the shadow, I always like to look at the shadow because the shadow really gives us the, <clears throat> the, the juicy part of what it is that we're here to, to transform. And <clears throat> if you have, if you have at least your finger on the pulse of that shadow, then you are empowered to work with that energy and not against that energy. So what he goes on to say about the gene key one is that <clears throat> the creative energy is a give and a take a flow of um, a flow of energy that moves from the let's call it the happy end of things where we're expressing our creativity to the lower end of the spectrum, which is where we, we feel it as depression, sadness, melancholy, um, aloneness. Uh, we, we call it a lot of different things, but it's where there's an incubation of what is going to become expressed in the creative world. In other words, we have to have both. We have to have both. But in our human mind, and maybe it's telescoped to us from the world at large, we have to be happy. And there's something wrong with you if you're not happy. But that's the first thing from the truth. In human design, when we look at the emotional center, what we see for of everybody is that the energy of emotions flows like waves, right? With a peak and a valley or a peak and a trough and all points in between, right? There's the rise to the peak and then there's the fall down into the trough. When we get to the trough, we tend to experience that as that melancholy or sadness or depression, I guess some people call it. And I, I, I think it's a slippery slope for us to start identifying with that shadow 
Instead, I'd love for you to embrace that and recognize that it is just another swing of the pendulum, right? That out of that quiet, that solitude maybe, or that um, that that being pulled away, you know, to uh, away from the outer world or away from that happy expression and the creative energy is the incubation of new ideas. It's the space to create something on its inner planes before it gets expressed in the outer planes. So we have that swing of this pendulum, right? And it's always happening. And I find it interesting that the gates one and two are not on the emotional center. We humans experience the energies of those two things as if it was emotional energy, but it's on the soul center. It is on the identity center, the yellow diamond. Let me see if I can pull out a human design chart and show you guys. I was going to pull out my own chart, but I don't want to do that because I've written all over it. And <laughs> so here's our sample chart. You see that yellow diamond right there in the middle? That is the identity center. Leading up from the top to the throat is gate one, right? Gate one moving up to the throat. Gate two down here leading down to the sacral. So it's, yes, Suzanne says, how ironic. And I think it is extremely ironic that the energy that we think of as depression or melancholy, sadness, low, as well as what we think of as the expression, our self-expression, where we're able to be out in the world doing what we love and expressing it to people are on the soul, right? It's who we are fundamentally here to be. And that should give you peace, right? That should give you um, joy inside to know that even though you may be experiencing a time and and is there any is there any hard and fast rule about how long that lasts no it lasts as long as it needs to last and that in itself can be disconcerting right because sometimes we want we want to shift out of that melancholy so badly that we're like seeing the we're seeing it and every day we're looking at it. And if it goes on for any length of period, suddenly now we want to label it as depression. And I'm not saying that there aren't literally clinical depression, you know, in our world. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to think about that. What if someone over the period of time gets so into this lower end expression of this energy that the chemical receptors in the brain begin to be more plentiful at this low end and creates a clinical depression as opposed to it being an illness kind of thing. I don't know. I wish I knew. But I can tell you that that time period of the low is just as important as the expression of the high periods, right? So we need both. We need both. They're both sitting here in our soul. It's giving our, our, maybe it is all about us being able to hear more clearly what it is that we want to express from our souls. Either way, when you look at it, it it's a beautiful thing. It just is the natural order of the universe to have both of those energies. All right. Um, so then I also wanted to talk a little bit about the Jupiter moon or Jupiter earth sun. This is a great day. In other words, I think one of the reasons I really wanted to bring this up was because a day like today really enhances the optimism, the, um, the beauty, the, we, we feel good on a day like today when the sun is opposing Jupiter and when the earth is conjunct Jupiter, there's, there's this kind of feeling of optimism and hopefulness and excitement that kind of goes through the collective. And, uh, uh, one of the things I want you to be aware of is that that today stands in opposition to that energy at the low end of the spectrum. So don't be alarmed when we return in a couple of days back down to the lower uh, end of that energy, or when you personally go through that 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 thing. Um, sometimes this energy is a recipe for overdoing it right? Overdoing it. We feel so good. You know, our bank accounts look good at the moment. So we overspend, we overeat, we over imbibe, we, you know, just overdo it. So be very careful today and tomorrow 
about overdoing it over expressing any of those energies isn't a good thing right we're still we're still wanting balance we're still wanting harmony um don't get so excited today and so in love and so wonderful uh, enjoy it enjoy it i don't mean to take it away from you but don't don't get so high just that you now feel so dropped off the cliff and now you're down 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 make sense I hope so. Let's see. I've got some comments in here. Um, let's see. Roseanne, damn phone, can't type with your sister. Uh, it's all about <laughs> Natasha. When the shadow comes, I ask, why are you here? As I would ask a friend. I like that. That's a great idea. And uh, let's see. Suzanne also looked up gods for us. And Callius is the Roman sky god. Anu is the Mesopotamian sky sky god uranus is the primordial god of the sky yeah isn't that interesting primordial meaning from the very beginnings right from the very beginnings that uranus was the god of the sky and gaia i believe was his wife remember that story i told you where they birthed cronus saturn and um, he castrates, Saturn castrates Uranus. It's really funny, kind of a funny and interesting mythology about the idea of being able to move forward, right? And um, remember, that was the story where his, uh, his genitals were thrown into the ocean and upsprung Aphrodite out of the sea. It's really kind of funny. It almost feels to me like a passing of the torch from the masculine to the feminine um not sure but it, it's always always interesting it's an interesting dynamic so i i i i want everybody to understand this because um so many times we want to label those feelings those shadow feelings when they come up as bad but i love what natasha said ask it what it wants what is it here for what are you showing me um, because it may be that it's showing you that you're on to your next creative adventure, but it begins in the quiet, right? In the seed. In the seed, there's quiet, but there's a lot that you can't see that there's a lot going on within the seed before the seedling um, bursts through. So <laughs> Roseanne, Roseanne says, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Aphrodite is made of male genitals. Or the male genitals um, made fertile the ocean, the, the, the energy in the ocean. And from that joining, she sprung up. <laughs> I think it's funny. All right. So I am not seeing Veva out there, uh, but I'm assuming she may listen later. So Veva, if you're out there, I have your chart. I've sent it to you via uh, Facebook, which I meant to check before I got on live this morning, and I didn't. So I don't know that you've received it. But I am going to talk a little bit about your chart. And as uh, assuming I can find it now, um, because so many times I do readings and I hear from people about how important it was for them to hear that, that it maybe wasn't their chart I was looking at, but it was certainly something that they needed to hear. And um, in that respect, then, even though maybe she's not listening, I have her chart here, and I won't necessarily show all the details, Veva, because I don't necessarily have your permission, but let's talk it through. Because she is someone, now we've, locked, we've looked at a lot of charts over the last few days, and <laughs> um, the, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because Roseanne says, oh boy, rewrite mythology. <laughs> um, I love mythology. And maybe we can rewrite a modern mythology of what's happening here on the planet. That would be awesome. Or maybe it is all a mythology and it's a story that we're writing as we go along. Wouldn't that be interesting? Um, so we have looked at a lot of charts over the last few days. Well, many, not a lot maybe, but many charts. And they've been in, you know, the 12th house uh, energy where Mars is turning retrograde and forcing people on an inner plane to look at what's sabotaging them. Um, ooh, my ears ringing. What uh, is sabotaging them? What it is that is their shadow that they're not seeing uh, uh, clearly. And we've seen relationship houses being hit. We've seen the career houses being hit. 
in Veva's case, it is the house of the mind that's being hit by Mars. And by uh, the sign, then of course it's Saturn, Black Moon, Lilith, Pluto, that is moving through your third house of the mind, communication, teaching, learning, etc. So um, maybe without showing her birth information, I can show you where this is in the chart. So what you can see here, if I move it this way, is that this is where Mars is, right over here. And this is the third house in her chart right there. Third house, house of communication, house of the mind, house of teaching and learning. And so there's a lot of emphasis going on in the third house here. And when I see the third house with a lot of um, planets in it, there's a lot going on in that person's life because the third house rules trips, like short trips, things, you know, that you would drive from here, maybe, I don't know, to your friend's house, to your sibling's house, to your client's houses, etc. So there's a lot of activity going on here. There's a lot of energy around communication. That means that you may be in the position of having to speak a lot. Maybe you're doing some, some training on your own. Maybe you're a teaching a lot. Not sure what you do out in the world, Veva. Um, but it seems like things have been very busy for you in that respect. And when things are really busy in a place, in a house that's very busy, and a planet turns retrograde in it, it almost feels like er, someone pulled back the reins and everything came to a standstill. So I want you to understand that is not a bad thing. It's sort of like this energy of entropy that we were talking about this morning, right? You're, there's that that swing of the pendulum. When Mars turns, it's moving through, by the way, starting May 12th through June 26th, the area that it will retrograde through. So you can almost get a hint over the next few weeks about what it is that may be coming to a standstill or what it is that will be turning inward for you to work on. So let's say, for example, let's just let's just say you're a teacher. And right now you are teaching, teaching, teaching. Maybe you're coming to the end of the teaching program, whatever it is that you've been working on. And then Mars turns retrograde. And so there's suddenly a realization. Now, what am I going to do? What am I going to fill my time with? What am I going to work on? And it's a really good time then to go inward and start developing a new program, perhaps not launching it, but developing a new teaching program. Maybe it's that you are going to go back to school or go through some kind of accreditation or go through some kind of of certification program, that is a good use of that energy, right? Learning, you know, filling up within instead of taking action on the outer world. Now, as this relates to the mind, the mind is sometimes running the show in a way that's not positive for us. Um, for example, if your mind is telling you things, you know, whispering to you, um, do this, do this, do this, do this, but it isn't in your human design to do that. And it isn't in your type and strategy. Let's say you're a projector and you have to wait for an invitation, but your mind is telling you to take action. If you listen to the mind, you're going to end up blowing out your energy. You're going to end up in a project that you get enmeshed in that you don't necessarily want to be in part of. So here's a very strong indication to really do a mind dump right? Look in the mind, see what's been there, what's stopping you, what thoughts are going through, what's yapping at you. Um, maybe there are some things going through your mind that you no longer need, right? That are some energies of release that you need during this Mars uh, transit through here. Um, it moves right up to your I see the, which is an angle and the dividing point between the third house and the fourth house. And it seems like there's some work to be done before when, once Mars turns back to direct motion and leaves the RX zone on October 8th, it hits your, your fourth house cusp, which means then it emerges into perhaps a move perhaps taking action in a way that solidifies a foundation that that creates more safety and security. So there's something very important going on in the third house for you. And I wish you were here to give us feedback on that. But maybe tomorrow, if you can join us after listening to this, you can kind of fill us in on some of the things that are going on for you. Now, because 
Mars's ruler is Aries. We look at the Aries part of the chart as well to see what's going on. Aries for you is crossing over between the uh, fifth house and the sixth house. So your moon is being affected here. Ceres is being affected here. And the reason I really look at Aries for everybody is Eris is here. And she is that goddess of discord. And for all of us, she's right there where in the same degree span, albeit not the same sign, but because she's in the degree span that, that uh, Mars will be transiting through, um, chances are it's going to fire off in our chart. And what's going to fire off here for you possibly is health challenges. So I want you to be very aware of what's going on in your body because the mind can keep you moving, moving, moving and forgetting to take care of yourself, feeding yourself, getting enough water, getting enough rest. Um, so the health area of your chart can become very uh, agitated. Um, it can also be a really good thing and give you, you know, an injection of energy. Let's say you'd been feeling sort of low energy. This can give you an injection of some really powerful energies. But remember to follow your type and your strategy before you do anything. Now, the moon is also going to be affected for you. It's one of the degrees that Mars transiting in Capricorn or Aquarius at that point in time is going to be triggering for you in Aries. Your moon is in the fifth house of creativity and expression of that creativity, that very feminine, creative energy. So here we have the possibility of some really interesting energies coming up for you around being able to create maybe a new teaching program or in some creative endeavor that maybe you've put off for a while that you want to get enacted. But remember, Mars is retrograde. So take action on the inner planes. Don't go out and launch anything uh, unless it's going to launch before Mars goes uh, retrograde on June 26th. Um, I would also like to have a conversation with her because today's sun Jupiter opposition by transit is lighting up her natal Uranus in the first house and her natal Chiron in the seventh house. What's going on in your relationships? Are you claiming more and more of your own power in a relationship? Are you, um, in the process of, um, maybe, starting a new relationship, letting go of an old one. I would love to know that too. Uh, so if that makes sense to you all, then maybe you can take some little nuggets out of that about what is going on in your own minds, uh, because our minds are, <laughs> the mind is a terrible thing to waste, but it's also a terrible thing to use without running it through the real authority in your body, because it can convince you of all kinds of things that are not correct for you. Okay, I think that's done. I'm done for today. I'm going to check one thing here, make sure there wasn't, oh, I didn't, I think, tell you some of the other things going on as far as the moon is concerned. So let me just finish up with that. Today, today the moon is in a sextile to Mercury and a sextile to Uranus. A sextile is a 60 degree angle. It brings out the best of our gifts and our talents. A sextile does. It, it really helps us to see what we're really good at, right? or helps us to express what it is that we're really good at. So today the moon in a sextile to Mercury is perhaps being able to express our feelings and our emotions in an appropriate and clear manner. And the moon in a sextile to Uranus means maybe some surprises, maybe some emotional outbursts, uh, maybe being able to identify an emotion before you express it. That sometimes we don't get right? Um, and when I look at the fact that the moon is in a sextile to both Mercury and Uranus, to me, those are interesting because Mercury rules the lower mind and Uranus the higher mind. So I think with the moon sextile to both, we can maybe see where we can bring some really highly creative energy in and how we might be able to express that energy. So to me, that's a setup for a really good day. I think it's optimistic. I think it's beautiful. I think it's uh, it's a feel-good day. Just remember not to go overboard in the expression of that. Follow your type, your strategy, and your authority, and you should be fine. And if you don't know what that means, you got to look it up, right? Look me up, get your human design chart, and find out what that means for you. And my website, www.living-hyphen.com.
astrology.com. All right, everybody. I love you all. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Have a great day. Bye for now.